4.5 billion years ago, Earth is formed. Nobody knows why, how, or even its purpose. As time passes and life is formed, different colonies would come and go. As humans evolved in life as a whole being extremely tough, entertainment was always a huge part of humanity. In the 15th century, golf was born in Scotland, and by the 1700s it had made its way across the Atlantic. Huge names began being produced from the sport, and kids were being inspired. In 1940, when the world was at war, a young boy would be born who would go on to dominate a sport like the world had never seen. Columbus, Ohio, 1940. A city booming with jobs after the breakout of the war and detracting migrants from all across the country. Helen Schoner of German descent and Charlie Nicholas, a pharmacist, welcomed their son, Jack William Nicholas. Jack's dad ran several successful drugstores throughout Columbus, but in his younger days was a very skillful athlete. He played state football and eventually went on to play semi-pro for the Portsmouth Spartans, a team that would eventually make it to the NFL, and you would know them today as the Detroit Lions. As well as football, Charlie played tennis, becoming a local champion, and in his spare time became a scratch golfer. With no surprise, growing up, Jack was introduced to the sport very early on. He played baseball, tennis, track and field, and even football like his dad. One thing he did take up that his dad didn't was basketball, a relatively new sport and one young Jack would be very good at. To fast forward really quickly, Jack got so good at basketball playing shooting guard, he received an honourable mention and received interest from colleges including Ohio State. Jack played basketball at Upper Arlington High School, whose nickname and mascot are called the Golden Bears. One of the rumours of why Nicholas was called it. Now, to rewind back to 10 years old, so fairly late in today's day and age, but probably very young back then, Jack began playing golf. His athletic background and naturally good skill set allowed him to produce a round of 51 over 9 holes at the Schiotto Golf and Country Club. It was here Jack would practice his craft and his love for the game would grow. He also met lifelong golf coach Jack Kraut, an ex-PGA tour player who was once friends with Byron Nelson and Ben Hogan. The pair would get to work and with the knowledge of Grout and the ability of Nicholas, they were creating a monster. By age 12, Jack had won five straight Ohio State junior titles, and by age 13, had broke 70 for the first time, became the youngest qualifier of the US junior amateur, and was now playing off a handicap of plus three. This insane progression has never been repeated, and Jack was only going to get better. Through high school, he won the Tri-State Championship, and he had shot 66 in an event breaking the course record. By 16, he had his first hole in one and was now competing with the professionals. In 1956, he shot 64 at the Ohio Open. This was a professional competition that Jack would go on to win, meaning between 10 and 17, Jack had won 27 events. The following year, Jack played in his first US Open, but failed to make the cut. In the same year, he played in his first three PGA Tour events, placing 12th at the Rubber City Open and 12th again at the Buick Open. So the standard was pretty clear what Jack was trying to set, and everyone knew who he was. The talk of the town was this big football-like figure who hit the ball a country mile, was just dominating everything in the amateur scene, and was now beating the pros. In college, the story was the same. He dominated. Whilst attending Ohio State, Nicholas won two US amateurs and the NCAA championship, becoming the first person ever to win the individual and the US amateur in the same year. In 1960, competing at the US Open, 20-year-old Nicholas shot two under par, finishing in second place two strokes behind winner Arnold Palmer. This score remained the lowest ever by an amateur in the US Open, until Victor Hovland beat the record in 2019. Nicholas played the final 36 holes with Ben Hogan, who later remarked that he'd just played 36 holes with a kid who should have won by 10 shots. The same year, Nicholas came 13th at the Masters, and he hadn't even left college yet. In 1961, and after winning the Walker Cup, Jack graduated college, made majoring in pre-pharmacy. He intended following in his father's footsteps in the drug industry, but changed his career path to study insurance. He never wanted to turn pro and was going to follow in his idol Bobby Jones' footsteps instead, selling insurance and playing amateur golf. His goal was to become the first amateur to win the Masters. While studying, he met Barbara Bash, who was a nursing student at Ohio State, and in 1960, the pair got married. In September the following year, Jack and Barbara gave birth to their first of five children, Jack Jr. Now with the pressure of having a child, Jack had a choice to make. Continue selling insurance and playing golf as a hobby, or take the plunge into a new and upcoming sport, with visual success already being shown from people he'd already beat. Months later in November, 
the number one ranked amateur of the past three years turned professional to support his family. Shortly after turning professional, Jack's agent, Mark McCormick, was interviewed by an Australian writer, Don Lawrence, who inquired about the American golf scene. When McCormick described Nicholas, Lawrence referred to the large, strong and blonde player as the Golden Bear, another reason why the name may have stuck. So with a purpose to play golf outweighing a legacy, Jack had cash to earn. This new lad on tour was out driving everyone, and his huge stature was extremely intimidating. So intimidating that it didn't take long for Jack to win. Like in his amateur days, Nicholas was going for the big ones, and with a family at home needed the one that paid the most. In just 17 starts, Jack got his first win. But not just any kind of win, the US Open. Not only winning the biggest competition in America, Jack beat America's best player, Arnold Palmer. The pair was forced to enter an 18-hole playoff the following day, kick-starting the Palmer-Nicholas rivalry, earning him $17,000 and attracting a huge following of new viewers to the sport. This came as a huge shock to Palmer. A man who was the poster boy for the sport now had a new kid on the block, lapping up all his glory. The same year, Nicholas won another two times, making 26 out of 26 cuts, 16 top 10s, came third in the money list, winning $60,000, and won Rookie of the Year. With his family secure, the life of an insurance man was over. People around him could see what Jack was about to become, even though he may have had his doubts. In 1963, the man with the most majors ever would get off to an unbelievable start. With no majors the year before, Jack made up for it the following year. He won the 1963 Masters by one shot over Tony Lima, winning $20,000, and in the same year won the PGA Championship, two shots over Dave Reagan. He'd win another three events that year, and despite Arnold Palmer not winning a major, still nipped ahead of Nicholas to lead the money list. The pair did put their rivalry aside though, teaming up at the World Cup of Golf to win the cup for the US. Nicholas's meteoric rise to fame immediately after turning professional enabled opportunities for him to earn significant endorsement income. These business opportunities were facilitated by Mark McCormack, who also managed Palmer and Gary Player. Into the early 1960s, TV golf consisted of the occasional coverage of the big events along with regional and national golf shows or made for TV golf contests such as All-Star Golf, Challenge Golf, CBS Match Play Classic and Shell's Wonderful World of Golf. As the schedule started expanding, some wondered if there was suddenly too much TV golf. This association was the start of the agency that became known as the International Management Group. IMG. With the rivalry being televised all around the world and the big three making more money than golf had ever seen, only Palmer won a major that year. Nicholas, however, would top the season money list, albeit by $81. In 1965 and 1966, Jack would redeem his majorless season with back-to-back -back Masters wins. In 65, he'd obliterate the field, finishing 17 under par, with second place Palmer and player at eight under, nowhere to be seen. He broke Ben Hogan's 72-hole scoring record of 273 in 1953, when he compiled a new aggregate score of 271. After Jack's record performance, Augusta National underwent some minor changes to make the course tougher. If there's one thing Augusta National hate, is their course getting outplayed. In 1966, the following year, Augusta had the help of Mother Nature as the conditions were brutal. A three-way 18-hole playoff was needed when Jack Nicklaus, Tommy Jacobs and Gay Brewer finished 72 holes tied at 288, the second highest winning score in Masters history. In the playoff, when Nicholas birded the 11th hole, he took a two-stroke edge over Jacobs and maintained that edge until the end. Brewer was never a factor in the playoff but did win the 1967 Masters the next year. With the victory, Nicholas became the first back-to-back -back winner of the Masters, and the youngest two-time and three-time winner. His spectacular 65 season saw him finish 28 worldwide events with five victories, seven runner-ups, 19 top five finishes, and 23 top 10 finishes. His 66 season saw him complete the career Grand Slam at Murfield in Scotland under difficult weather conditions. At age 26, this made him the youngest player to win all four major championships. At this point in his career, people were thinking they were looking at the best version of Jack. What he had achieved was absurd up to this point. He broke more records in 67 and rubbed salt into Palmer's wounds once again as he beat his 72 hole record as he won another US Open. Things did start to take a downward spiral however between 68 and 69 as he didn't win a major. He packed a lot of weight on and he lost his dad at the age of 56. These two years were extremely hard for Jack and at this time family was more important, not golf. After hitting a low the only way was up. 
Nicholas began working out and lost a staggering 25 pounds. With his lighter body full of emotion and now more driven than ever, people were about to see the best Jack of all time, a vision that nobody thought was possible. Five months later, Jack entered the 1970 Open Championship. Conditions in Scotland were ruthless. The wind howled up to 56 miles per hour and St Andrews wasn't going to let anyone win without a fight. Despite the conditions, Jack and Doug Sanders fought off the rest of the chasing pack, which included the likes of Lee Trevino and Tony Jacklin. The pair had a final round of five under par and were forced into a playoff. On the 18th hole, Nicholas drove about 380 yards through the par 4 green with a three wood and was forced to pitch back to the hole. His eagle pitch finished approximately eight feet short of the hole. Nicholas sank the putt, threw his putter into the air and the emotion was finally allowed to escape as he was thrilled to have won the Open at the home of golf and he knew his dad was watching down. Afterwards, Jack said, My father died and I sort of realised that he had certainly lived his life through my golf game. I really hadn't probably given him the best of that. So I sort of got myself back to work. So this one was an emotional one for me. This newfound motivation and ambition would kickstart a 10 year domination, but with a newfound look on golf. The following year, Jack proved his commitment by winning the PGA Championship, this becoming the first person to complete the double Grand Slam. He finished second at that year's Masters and fifth in both of the other majors, as well as winning four times on the PGA Tour. The progression was not slowing down and neither was the winning, but Jack was starting to play less. Having five kids now, Nicholas's playing schedule was being molded around his family life and that was the main focus. Nicholas won the first two major championships of 1972 by three shots, each in wire to wire fashion. He won the Masters and the US Open, creating talk of a calendar year Grand Slam. Nicholas opened with a four under par 68 at Augusta National and never looked back. He was the only player under par for that week as he in the field battled difficult scoring conditions. In the US Open at Pebble Beach, again under severe conditions, Nicholas struck a one iron on the 218 yard par 3 17th hole during the final round into a stiff, gusty ocean breeze that hit the flag stick and ended up three inches from the cup. This victory was Nicholas's 11th professional major, tying in with Walter Hagen and made him the first player to win the US Amateur and the US Open Championship on the same golf course. This was until Matt Fitzpatrick achieved the same feat in 2022. In the mid-70s and knowing that golf wasn't going to be around forever, Jack began designing courses in his spare time. Nicholas has left a legacy across the whole world designing over 300 golf courses. Designing all these courses does come with its benefits though. Eventually, you're probably going to play one. That's exactly what happened in 1973 when he won at the Ohio Kings Island Open, becoming the first person ever to win on a golf course that they had designed. So the future was being planned, but Jack was still living in the present. And when he wasn't winning majors, he was winning the fifth major and being inducted into the World Golf Hall of Fame. In 75, he won three consecutive events, winning the Doral Eastern Open, the Sea Pines Heritage Classic, and the Masters. The year after he won the PGA Tour money list, only playing in 16 events and without even winning a major. His time started slipping away from him and he was already the most successful golfer of all time. Having the most majors and just passing Ben Hogan's PGA Tour wins record, Jack was just polishing the end of his career. That polish would start to shine again though. Unlike Tiger who had a number he was aiming for, Jack was just enjoying golf whilst he could. And if the wins came, great. It would be great in 1978 when Nicholas won the Triple Grand Slam, just to add to his lengthy list of accomplishments. Jack Nicholas became the first player in the modern era to win two Opens at St Andrews and the fourth in all after Bob Martin, J.H. Taylor and James Braid. His third Open title came a year after his duel in the sun with Tom Watson at Turnbury. Following a switch in the wind so that it was against going out and behind coming home for the final round, Watson surprisingly slipped out of contention with a 76 and Oosterhaus had a 73. Instead, the Open seemed to be between Nicholas and Simon Owen, both of whom had started one behind. Nicholas finished the scoring at seven under, winning by two. That career high came with the cost of a career low, as in 1979 he didn't win anything. For the first time in his career, Jack finally knew what it was like not to win, and finally his fellow peers could relate. In the off-season, lifelong coach Jack Grout noticed that he'd become a little bit more upright in his swing. The two worked rigorously around the clock to flatten out his swing to make sure he was ready for the upcoming season. He also hired the help of Phil Rogers to sharpen up his short game. Whatever happened in that off-season worked. In 1980, at age 40, 
Nicholas led the PJ Tour in total driving, a statistic that combines a player's ranking in average distance off the tee and a percentage of fairways hit. His total driving number that season was 23, a figure no player has matched over the course of an entire season since. In with those stats was another US Open and another PGA Championship, taking his total to 16 majors. You could clearly see that Jack was saving himself for the big events. He only competed in 13 events that year, including the majors, statting up one runner-up, eight top 25s and three top 10s. The 80s were the very end of his career and it was definitely starting to take its toll on him. Between 81 and 85, he only managed seven top 10 finishes, three runner-ups, but didn't manage a PGA Tour event. He did, however, have a huge role in both Ryder Cups in that time. In 81, winning all of his matches, giving him a record of 4-0, helping the US to a victory, and in 83 as he captained the winning side. So with the cogs turning, albeit slowly, Jack needed one more bang to go out on. With that major number pretty much secure for the rest of golf's jeopardy, this one was just for him. At the 1986 Masters, Jack wasn't seen for the first two days. When day three arrived, he was just peering into the top 10, but the fight was between three of the game's biggest names, fighting it out for the top. Jack Nicholas played his first eight holes in even par, but stormed into contention with birdies at 9, 10 and 11. Jack then bogeyed the 12th to fall three behind the leaders. After a par at 14, Nicholas began his legendary charge at 15 after hitting his 204 yard approach shot to 12 feet. He buried the port for Eagle to pull within two shots of Ballesteros. Nicholas then hit his tee shot on 16 to within three feet, and after holding his birdie putt, he was within one shot of Ballesteros, who was playing on the 15th hole. Seve was in prime position to go for the green in two, but Paul hooked his approach shot into the water. After failing to get up and down, Ballesteros bogeyed the hole, giving Nicholas a share of the lead. Seve then three-putted the 17th to fall out of contention, but Kite had a 12-foot birdie putt on 18 to tie Nicholas. Kite barely missed his putt on the high side to miss a playoff by one shot. Norman left for dead after his double bogey on 10 birded 14, 15 and 16 to pull within one shot of the lead. After hooking his drive way left on 17, Norman made an incredible shot between two pines to get within eight feet. Norman buried the birdie putt, his fourth straight, to tie for the lead. Norman then hit a perfect drive on 18, needing a birdie for his first major championship. However, Norman pushed his approach shot into the gallery and subsequently missed his 15-foot par putt to finish one stroke behind. Nicholas had stormed back, shooting 30 on the back nine to win his sixth Masters title and become the oldest Masters champion at age 46. In what was the most memorable and exciting final rounds in Masters history, five different players held at least a share of the lead in the final round. But history was written in the stars and the Golden Bear roared on. This victory was to be his last in his long career on the PGA Tour. During the course of a 25 year span, Nicholas won 18 major championships and finished second 18 times, excluding the second place finish at the 1960 US Open as an amateur. He also placed third nine times and fourth seven times in this span, and was one stroke out of a playoff on five of those occasions. Nicholas became eligible to join the senior PGA Tour when he turned 50 in January 1990, at which point he declared, I'm never satisfied. Trouble is, I want to play like me, and I can't play like me anymore. Nicholas has won all the senior majors with the exception of the Senior Open Championship. However, he never played in that event until he turned 60, and it was only elevated to a major in 2003. In 2005, and after the tragic death of his 17-month-old grandson, Jake, who drowned in a jacuzzi, the time had come for Jack to retire. Jack made his way to St. Andrews to take the long-awaited walk over the Swilkin Bridge, and in an emotional farewell, sank his most meaningful pot of his career. There have been prettier swings of the club than Jack Nicholas. There may have been better ball strikers than Jack Nicholas. There have definitely been better short game exponents than Jack Nicholas. Other golfers have putted as well as Jack Nicholas. There may have been golfers as dedicated and fiercely competitive as Jack Nicholas, but no individual has been able to develop, combine and sustain all of the complex physical skills and the immense mental and emotional resources the game demands at its highest level as well as Jack Nicholas and for as long as Jack Nicholas has.